you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20, John chapter 20, we are going to be looking at this chapter talking about the resurrection. And I just want to be honest with you, this whole week I have been so excited, so excited thinking that we don't serve a Savior who is in the ground, dead and buried, but we serve a Savior who is alive. And what that means for me and you is that we can call on Him anytime we need. We can talk to Him. We can know Him. We can have a relationship with Him. And I hope that you will see that this morning, that we will leave going out of here celebrating our risen Savior. I'd like to begin this morning just by reading the last two verses of John chapter 20. John chapter 20, beginning with verse 30. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help our unbelief. Lord, I pray that if we are here this morning, you would grip our hearts with the fact that Jesus is alive. Lord, as we have sang and worshipped you as a risen Savior, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us now through the power of your word. And Lord, that we wouldn't just walk out of here unchanged, but Lord, that we would believe in the resurrection and it would change us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a Sunday school teacher at a church, and uh, she taught the young kids' Sunday school class, and it was the Sunday before Easter. And she told all of the kids, she says, next Easter, I want you to bring a plastic egg. And in the egg, I want you to put something that is meaningful to you about Easter. And so all the kids came back on Easter Sunday morning. They all had an egg. They all had something they had put in it. So she began, the teacher, to open up the eggs and to pull out the things in there and began to talk about them. The first one, she opened up the plastic egg and there was a little flower in it. And the teacher said, you know, this uh, flower represents springtime and new season and the new life that we can have in Jesus The second egg a child brought up, and it was a picture drawn in crayon of Jesus. And she said, yes, that's absolutely right. We worship Jesus on Easter. A third egg came up from a child, and it had a nail in it, a small little nail. She held up the nail. She said, this nail represents the nails that went in Jesus' hands and in His feet when He was crucified for us. A fourth egg came up and it had a little pebble in it. And she said, this represents the stone that was rolled in front of the tomb after Jesus was buried. Last of all, a young little boy, he was a seven-year-old boy, and he had a mental disability. His name was Brian. And he came up and he gave the teacher the egg. And the teacher opened up the egg and all the other children began to laugh. Because in Brian's egg, there was nothing. And Brian jumped up and he didn't wait for the teacher. And he says, my egg is full of emptiness, just like the tomb of Jesus. Brian understood what I think we might miss a lot of times. There's a lot of things that contribute to our faith. We have the life of Jesus. We have the cross of Christ. We have God's Word. We have the church and gathering together. But I want to tell you, if we don't have the resurrection, then all of it comes crashing down. If we don't have the resurrection from the dead, then all of it is for nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14 says this, And if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Go down to verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. The cross of Christ, the life of Christ, the church doesn't mean anything if Jesus has not been raised from the dead. This morning... 
I pray that you would believe in the resurrection. Without it, we are still in our sins. Without it, we are still separated from God, bound for an eternity in hell. And I pray that this morning you would celebrate and recognize and believe in the resurrection. If Jesus is alive, it means that you can call to him when you are at your most hopeless point. If Jesus is alive, that means you can go from being an outcast and in your sin and shame to being redeemed and a son and daughter of God. If Jesus is alive, that means just as they had baptism this morning, you can walk from death out of the grave into life. That's what the resurrection means. And I want to take the rest of our time looking at three things that the resurrection brings to us this morning. Three things the resurrection brings to us. First, the resurrection brings hope to the hopeless. The resurrection brings hope to the hopeless. John chapter 19 records the death of Jesus. It is probably one of the darkest and most hopeless situations for Jesus' followers. It ends with Jesus dying on a cross and being put in a tomb. And you've got to think at the end of John chapter 19... All of his disciples are completely hopeless. The man that they had loved for years, had followed for years, who had taught them, they had left everything for him. He is now in the grave. And it is a dark and hopeless time. It is in that context we see Mary going to the tomb. Look at John chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. And while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid Him. Mary Magdalene was going to the tomb that morning. Jesus was crucified on a Friday night. Saturday was the Sabbath for Jews, and so they could not work or do things. And so the burial process had been rushed. And she was returning after the Sabbath to complete the burial process, to have maybe some closure for her Lord and Savior. And she goes and she finds the tomb is empty. And she runs back fearing that someone has taken the body. And it says she goes to Simon Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I love this Phrase, the disciple whom Jesus loved. All throughout the book of John, we have this character, the disciple who Jesus loved. And most scholars agree that it was John himself. And I got to say, if I'm writing the gospel, that might be how I describe myself, right? John is putting it there. I'm the disciple who Jesus loved. And so she goes and tells Peter and John what has happened. And they take off. Look at verse 3. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other's disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. I found it really interesting as I was reading this passage that they would record who won the race. Isn't that funny? That that John thought fit. Hey, I want you all to know I won, right? I I beat Peter. I don't know why it's included, um, but because it's here, I was reading it this week, and I was thinking about Wednesday night, we had our extravaganza out here, and there were these big blow-up inflatable things for all the kids, and after uh, it ended, all the kids were leaving. The big kids, me, your church staff, and then Ryan and Dylan decided to get on this inflatable obstacle course, and we decided to have a race. And so we all took off. And I wasn't going to say anything, but now that it's in the Bible, it just seems fitting to say who won. I beat Ryan and Dylan in that race, all right? It just just seems right. It's biblical. we got to declare who wins races. So, But anyway, that's free. That has nothing to do with anything. But they go and they run to the tomb. And I don't think they were competing. I don't think there was a race. I think they were running probably... Because the reason any of us would run, they are worried, they are helpless, hopeless. I remember my son, uh, just a few days ago, we were up at uh, my in-law's house and he had an umbrella out in their driveway. It was a beautiful day, so I don't know why he had the umbrella up. But the wind, a gust of wind took it and it started going to the road. And he took off running to grab it. 
And I saw my young son running to the road and it caused me to run, right? I was afraid, I was worried, it caused me to run. And I can think that Peter and John were running. And I can imagine the hopelessness and the dark place Peter was in as he ran. Peter had been with Jesus for years at this point. He was Jesus' right hand man, always right there. And on Friday, when Jesus needed him the most, Peter wasn't there. In fact, Peter had denied Jesus three times. And I can imagine that on that Sunday morning, Peter was in a really dark place. He was in a really hopeless situation. And now he hears that Jesus' body is stolen and he runs to that tomb. Look at what happens in verse 6. John stopped outside the tomb, but Peter just jumps right in. Look at verse 6. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up by itself. They go in, and I can imagine some confusion on their face. I wonder what they were thinking. Because if somebody would have stolen the body, wouldn't they have taken the grave clothes with it? Why would they have taken the time to fold the face cloth and put it neatly there? It's interesting. And it maybe gives an indication to what they were thinking. Look at verse 8. The other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in and he saw and believed. In just an instant, in the most hopeless situation possible, he sees this and hope starts to spring in his heart. Maybe Jesus is alive. I want to tell you what a difference an empty tomb makes to be a completely hopeless and desperate and in a dark place and then you see the empty tomb and now there is hope. I tell you, we all in this room are hopeless like Peter. We are in a dark place and we are hopeless. I want to tell you, I felt a tinge of hopelessness the other day when I looked in the mirror and I saw a gray hair coming up on my hair. I felt hopeless, right? And and many of us, we try and fight against aging, don't we? We put on creams and lotions. We put color in our hair and we try and fight against aging. And more than we fear aging, we also fear death. We don't want to reckon with the fact that we are mortal. That one day all of this will end. And we think if we can ignore death, then maybe death will ignore us. We are all hopeless like Peter if we're honest with ourselves. Because we go through this life and we live it and we think, what's the meaning of all of this? What is the purpose of all of this that I just live and die? But I want to tell you, the, the resurrection, the empty tomb, it gives you meaning today. The empty tomb gives you hope When you were in that hopeless and dark situation. Because the tomb is empty, that means Jesus is alive. And no matter what you're facing, no whatever dark place that you were in, Jesus can pull you out of it. Because guess what? This life and this earth are not our home. We have a home waiting for us for eternity in heaven. And if we would believe in Jesus and believe in the resurrection, we could have that eternal home waiting for us. And no matter what happens in this life, no matter what darkness comes our way, we have hope for the future. Because our God is not in a tomb, but He is risen. So first, the resurrection brings hope to the hopeless. Secondly, the resurrection brings redemption to the reviled. It brings redemption to the reviled. Peter and John, Mary and the other ladies were at the tomb. They all see it and then they leave. And Mary Magdalene is left alone at the tomb. Mary Magdalene, we don't know much about her. She was a faithful follower of Jesus. She was at the crucifixion. When other people weren't. When the disciples weren't. She was coming on this early morning to honor Jesus and finish the burial process when the other disciples weren't. The only other thing we know about Mary Magdalene is found in Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, this is what he says. Chapter 8 verse 1. Soon after he went... 
through, went on throughout the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, Mag- Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. That's all we know about Mary. Some think that she might have been the sinful woman in Luke chapter 7 with a promiscuous past. We aren't sure of that, but one thing we are sure of, Mary did have a past. She had seven demons in her. And when we think about, in biblical terms, how it describes people who were demon-possessed, they were oftentimes out of their mind, speaking crazy things. They were cutting themselves, throwing themselves into fire. They were disheveled, wearing seemingly rags. But you know what else? People who were demon-possessed at that time were? They were reviled by the community. They were outcasts. They were hated. They lived on the outskirts of society. And I ask, why do you think Mary followed Jesus around and was so faithful to Him? Well, she had seven demons. And Jesus had rescued her from it. I can imagine that Mary came to Jesus and she followed Him everywhere she went. She followed him and was so grateful that Jesus had rescued and redeemed her. And now we have Mary after everyone is gone and she is at the tomb and she's probably thinking, where am I going to go now? What am I going to do? I have no hope. I have nothing left. Jesus was my everything and now he is in the tomb and I don't even have his body. It is in that instant alone at the tomb we see verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. She is weeping. She is distraught. She looks into the tomb and she sees two angels. And they ask her, why are you weeping? She doesn't understand yet because they should have been tears of joy. And she says, well, I don't know where Jesus is. I don't know where his body is. Somebody has taken them. That brings us to verse 14. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. She doesn't recognize Jesus. Maybe through the tears in her eyes. Maybe Jesus is not revealing himself to her yet. But Jesus asks her two questions. Why are you weeping and whom are you seeking? And those two questions really challenged Mary's understanding of Jesus. It challenged Mary's understanding of who Jesus was and why he came. Because you see, most of the disciples and Mary and most of the followers of Jesus assumed the Messiah would be an earthly political figure a good teacher, and he would lead Israel into victory over Rome. And that's probably what Mary was thinking. And Jesus looks at her in that moment. and He says, why are you weeping? You've got too small a view of me. And the resurrection proves it. No mere man, no mere good teacher could raise from the dead. And I want to ask you this morning, is your view of Jesus too small? Is your view of Jesus too small? Do you believe that our risen Savior can act in your life and help you in your hardest and darkest moments? Or do you just believe, He's a good person. I might need to go to church, maybe hedge my bets a little bit in case this whole thing works out. And I'll kind of show up and be kind of a good person. And I see Jesus just kind of helping us morally along. If that's your view of Jesus, then I would please beg with you to elevate your view of Christ. Too often times we trivialize the eternal message of the resurrection. We spend an hour on a Sunday once a year to talk about the resurrection. And then we go about our life and we elevate and emphasize all the fleeting problems and pleasures of this world. And I want to tell you, it should be reversed. The resurrection should take priority. If Jesus is alive, He's not just a good teacher. He's not someone you should follow morally because He's a good person. Jesus is Lord. If He rose from the dead, that means He is the conquering King and we submit ourselves to Him. 
I ask that you would elevate your view of Jesus. And I think that's what he was asking Mary to do. Mary thought that he was just simply the gardener and she had turned her back to him. And then look at verse 16. I love this verse. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus looked at her. And how many times do you think Mary had heard her name in her life? How many times has somebody called Mary? Hey, Mary. She hears her name this time and it's different. She knows that voice. She's heard that voice before. It makes me think of John chapter 10, verse 3, when Jesus said, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. She heard her name by the risen Savior and she knew it was him. As I read this, as I think about this, you would think that Jesus would reveal himself in a different way to a different person, wouldn't you? You would think Peter was there, John was there. Peter was the rock on which God would build the church. Surely, Jesus would reveal himself in glory and splendor to Peter, right? It would be this miraculous, huge thing with lightning and thunder, and Jesus would be there, and Peter would see him, and it would be this glorious thing. I could probably think of a hundred people before Mary. But isn't that how Jesus works? In his tender and loving kindness, the first person to ever see the risen Savior was Mary Magdalene. Someone who was reviled, rejected, an outcast, a nobody. And how did he reveal himself to her? Not in splendor, not in majesty, but what did he do? He said her name. I'll tell you, church, I needed this this week. I want to tell you, no matter your past, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, the risen Savior knows your name. And He's standing here this morning on Resurrection Sunday and He's calling out to you. He's asking you to come to Him. Would you hear His voice? Would you respond? Would you believe? I want to tell you, if Jesus is alive, it means He knows you. He loves you. He offers grace and mercy to you. And He can move you from reviled to redeemed in an instant if you would believe in Him. The resurrection brings hope to the hopeless, redemption to the reviled, and finally, the resurrection brings life to anyone who would believe. It brings life to anyone who would believe. Jesus revealed Himself after this to the disciples. They were all in a room and He revealed Himself, but there was one disciple who was not there. Thomas was not there. And i got to say, wouldn't that have been awful to be Thomas? What do you think Thomas was doing in that moment? <laughs> what do you think? He shows up and all the disciples say, you, you aren't going to believe this. Jesus was here. Have you ever shown up to a party and you missed something? You showed up late and everybody tells you and describes it to you? That's how Thomas was. And look at Thomas's response. Verse 25, John chapter 20. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord... But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. What a statement by Thomas. We often call him doubting Thomas, that he doubted Jesus. But honestly, there's a big difference between doubt and unbelief. There's a big difference between doubting something And choosing not to believe. I heard a pastor say this. Unbelief is the decision to live your life as if there is no God. A deliberate decision to reject Jesus and all that He stands before. That's unbelief. I believe doubting is a normal part of the Christian life. That we will have doubts and we will have difficulties and troubles. But it's different from unbelief. Let's say that... I had some friends and we wanted to go eat dinner. And I had been texting them all week. And I said, hey, meet me at this restaurant on this day at this time. And on the day of that night, I texted them. And I said, hey, are you still good? You're going to meet me there. And they never responded. I might doubt that they're going to show up, right? 
but I still drive to the restaurant, right? I have my doubts, but it doesn't change my trajectory where I'm going. That's different from unbelief. If I was sitting there and I never received the text message, I said, they're not coming. I don't believe they're coming. What was that going to do? It's going to change my trajectory. I'm not going. I'm not showing up to that restaurant. I'm not going to be there. I want to tell you, you're going to have difficulties in life. You're going to have doubts in life. That's normal. Don't let your doubts turn to unbelief. Don't let your doubts and your discouragement and your struggles turn to unbelief. But keep believing in Jesus. Keep pushing forward on that trajectory. Thomas was not rebuked for doubting, but for his unbelief. Look at what he says. Jesus reveals himself to Thomas in verse 27. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. That's the heart of the message this morning on Resurrection Sunday. Would you believe in Jesus? Would you believe in the resurrection that his life means you can have life? That his life means you can have a different story? That you can have hope? Look at verse 29. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. I want to tell you this much, church. Jesus came and he died on the cross for your sins. He bore the penalty and the wrath of God that we all are owed. And he rose from the dead, conquering sin and death forever. He is reigning and ruling. And he offers you that salvation if you would believe. I want to close by looking at verse 31, the end of this passage that we read at the beginning. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Church, the risen Savior stands calling out your name, offering you life today. Would you receive it this morning? Let's pray. Father, thank You for the life that You offer us. Lord, I pray right now if there would be someone here who does not know You, who has not believed in You. Lord, I pray that today would be the day they would believe. That today they would turn from their sin and they would turn to the risen Savior who loves them with mercy and with grace and forgiveness. Lord, help us to believe in the resurrection. Help that belief to change how we act and live as we go out from here. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.